News of the day. Mr. Zimmerman, have you made a decision as to whether or not you want to testify in this case? With values that never die. There are certainly a lot of controversies or scandals brewing right now when it comes to the Obama administration. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Dealing with the federal government is not always high tech and it's not, not always user friendly. The stories, stories that, that matter. matter. This is a massive escalation in the tension here in Egypt. The issues that count. I don't know why the media tries to make this into a sensation. We have never hidden the fact that we supply Syria with weapons. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. He's got the red, white, blue, flying high on a farm. Semper Fi tattooed on his left arm. Spend a little more in the store for a tag in the back of his USA. Welcome to American Heartland. This is Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. Thank you so much for joining us on another broadcast of American Heartland. You can write to me, and please do. I look forward to receiving your emails, your letters, your thoughts, your concerns at values that never die at hotmail.com. Values that never die at hotmail.com. And certainly, you probably have a lot to say about what is happening now. The president has decided that he is going to bring us right to to a constitutional crisis. You heard that right. We are heading right into a constitutional crisis. Why? Because he has decided that he is going to ignore the laws that Congress has passed. He is going to ignore our constitutional process. And merely because he wants it to be so, he is going to shield about 5 million illegal immigrants from deportation. That is what he announced he is going to do. And he is trying to convince us this this is within the bounds of his executive authority when everyone knows, even, even the liberals are beginning to say, no, you are not behaving in a constitutional manner by bringing about this dramatic change upon our land. We don't have to take, you don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to take the word of analysts on Fox News. You don't have to take the word of analysts on uh, conservative talk radio. You don't even have to take the word of folks uh, like those of the Washington Post who are beginning to criticize the president's lawless behavior. You can just take Obama's own words. For years, he said, over and over again, that as president of the United States, he does not have the legal authority to do what he is going to do now. Listen to Obama criticizing Obama. I indicated uh, to Speaker Boehner several months ago that if, in fact, Congress failed to act, I would use all the lawful authority that I possess to try to make the system work better. And that's going to happen. That's going to happen before the end of the year. I'm going to do what I can do through executive action. I take the Constitution very seriously. The biggest problems that we're facing right now have to do with George Bush trying to bring more and more power into the executive branch and not go through Congress at all. And that's what I intend to reverse when I'm president of the United States of America. There are enough laws on the books by Congress that are very clear in terms of how we have to enforce uh, our immigration system. I know some people want me to bypass Congress and change the laws on my own. If, in fact, I could solve all these problems without passing laws in Congress, then I would do so. For me to simply, through executive order, ignore those congressional mandates would uh, not conform with my appropriate role as president. With respect to uh, the notion that I can just suspend deportations through executive order, uh, that's just not the case. This notion that somehow I can just change the laws unilaterally is just not true. There are laws on the books that Congress has passed. There are laws on the books that I have to enforce. I swore an oath to uphold the laws on the books. We're also a nation of laws. That's part of our tradition. That's not how 
That's not how our system works. That's not how our Constitution is written. I am not um, a, a, a dictator. I'm the president. One of the arguments that the president has been making is that he has, quote unquote, waited patiently for Congress to do its job. And because Congress has failed to do its job, then he, in his all-seeing, all-knowing wisdom, is basically going to do their job for them. It is true that the Senate passed a bipartisan, comprehensive immigration reform bill. And the Republicans have not put that bill up for a vote. Why? Guess what? They have the right to choose what pieces of legislation are voted upon. Hasn't Harry Reid done the same thing? How many bills have the Republicans passed? And Harry Reid has simply decided, because at this moment, and for the last few years, he has controlled the Senate, it is within his prerogative not to introduce those bills for a vote. And that is his right just like it has been Boehner's right not to present a bill. It is up to the head of the House to make that decision, as it is the right of the head of the Senate. And the president has specific constitutional powers, none of which include ignoring laws that Congress has passed and making up his own laws when Congress doesn't pass the laws that he wants them to pass. And what you can all see, based on that montage that we just played for you, is that Obama knows full well that what he is doing is illegal. He was a constitutional professor, and this is Constitution 101. The president is required based on an oath that he has taken to uphold existing laws. He cannot use his executive authority to do anything other than implement the laws that Congress has passed. He knows this. He told Hispanics who were pressing him to be more aggressive again and again that he wishes he could do more, but he simply cannot. And yet... On the heels of a major Republican victory in the midterm elections, he decided to ignore even his own best counsel. He decided to ignore it all and to now send us into uncharted territory. Because this is unprecedented. He's trying to tell us, as are some of his defenders, that other presidents have done the same, but it's not true. Other presidents used their executive authority in the manner in which the Constitution allowed them to use it. But this man has repeatedly used his executive authority in an illegal manner, so much so that the Republicans vowed that they were going to Sue him, and they are in the midst of launching a suit based on previous actions, let alone this latest action. So he knows it's unconstitutional, and he's going to do it anyways. That's really what he told us this week. I'm going to do it anyways because I want to do it. I'm doing it even if it's illegal and because I want to do it. What do you call that? Is he acting as a duly elected president? Is he acted as one who is serving the people? Is he acting as one who is upholding his very own oath of office? The answer to all of those questions is no. He isn't and he doesn't care. So what does this tell us? This tells us that we are now passing the point of no return. From this moment forward, we cannot treat him as we have treated any other president. 
because he is taking us into uncharted waters. The only parallel in American history to what he is doing existed in 1776 when the people revolted against a monarch and they created an entire new form of government. They declared that on this land, the will of the people would be supreme and that no one man would be able to dictate laws for the entire people. Well, it looks like our current president is now a lawless man. He is behaving outside the parameters of the law. During the summer, you will recall that I said that he is a danger to our state because by freeing Boberg, by, by um, trying to set Bo Bergdahl free, he allowed five Taliban commanders to be released. And I said at that moment, that day by day, week by week, month by month, he would continue to pose a threat to our safety, to our security. And it is very clear by this action that he is public enemy number one. He is public enemy number one to our constitution, to our republic, and to our way of life. As you can tell in this broadcast, I'm not mad. I'm not outraged. I was raised in a European home, and I think many Europeans will share this, this kind of story. My dad was a man who threw his weight around, oh, quite a lot. He was the patriarch of the family, and we all knew it. And he was strict, and he was tough, and he would raise his voice very, very often, trying to teach us to do better, to be better. Even if in retrospect, I think some of that was a little bit harsh. But when he was really mad and when he was really concerned, he would sit next to our fireplace, scrunch his eyes together in deep thought and say nothing. Say nothing. And believe it or not, that was more terrifying to me than any time when he raised his voice. Because I knew by that expression on his face that he was beyond anger, that he was so deeply concerned, so deeply perplexed by, say, my behavior or one of my sister's behavior, that now he had to think of how are we going to fundamentally fix a grave problem. And that something new and different would emerge from his mouth to solve the family problem. I feel that way today. I'm not outraged. I'm not mad. I am so deeply concerned that I am beginning to strategize. How are we going to fix this imminent threat and danger to the American Republic? How are we going to get this man out of the Oval Office? That is the number one challenge that we face today. So I recommend everybody out there, you don't have to waste your breath and your energy arguing how unlawful this is. We just played the clip. The president knows that he is behaving lawlessly and he is doing it on purpose. So it is everybody's duty and responsibility now to work together. Very simply, we've got to do one thing. We are casting the blame for everything that happens next clearly at his feet. And we have to work together to get him out of our Oval Office. He no longer belongs there. This is Dr. Grace. Upholding values that are never going to die. The stories that 
matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Welcome back. That's right. Wave after wave after wave. We have had an assault on our Constitution almost relentlessly by President Obama. And guess what? It has taught him to keep right on going because there have been no consequences. And it is time for us to show him just how seriously we take it here in the United States of America when a president acts outside of the law. Last night, Senator Ted Cruz, uh, sorry, a few nights ago, Senator Ted Cruz was among the most muscular, the most vocal in articulating how despotic is the behavior of this man. And what you're going to hear in the next two clips that we're going to play is first how brilliantly Senator Cruz lays out what's wrong with Obama's recent action. And then he talks about what he thinks the Republicans should do. And my point is, he's right on part one and wrong on part two. But let's take it a step at a time. This is what Senator Cruz very well, very brilliantly says about how despotic and out of control the president currently is. Roll it. Uh, We are unfortunately witnessing a constitutional crisis. What President Obama is doing is he is defying the law, he's defying the Constitution. You know, the president quite rightly said just a few weeks ago, his policies were on the ballot all over the country. This last election was a referendum on amnesty. And the American people overwhelmingly rose up and said, no, we don't want lawless amnesty. And I'm sorry to say President Obama's reaction is is defiant and it is angry with the American people. And that is right. So we have a constitutional crisis, a president who was ignoring the will of the people, a president who was ignoring the last election, a president who is acting in a completely unlawful, despotic manner. So he's 100 percent right on what he says. And then when Cruz and all the other Republicans who are upset about what's going on are asked, OK, what are you going to do about it? This is the kind of answers that these are the kind of answers that we're getting. Roll it. Step number one, the the new Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, should stand up and say, if you disregard the Constitution, if you disregard the law, if you issue this executive amnesty, the new Congress for the next two years will not confirm a single nomination, judicial or executive, other than vital national security positions, until you end this illegal amnesty. Now, that is a big and it's a dramatic step. It's never been done before in Congress. But the framers put in place checks and balances, and the confirmation power is a, is a tremendously potent authority given to the Senate. The Senate majority leader has the unilateral ability to stand up and say, if you defy Congress, if you defy the Constitution, if you defy the American people, none of your nominees will be confirmed. All right, what's point That's two? step number one. Step number two is we need to use the power of the purse, the most potent power Congress has. When we come back in January with a new Congress, we need to systematically pass appropriations legislation, funding the Department of Defense, funding uh, the, the, the VA, funding one department after another after another. And then once the vital functions are funded, we need to pass appropriations with riders specifically limiting the power of the Congress and the power of the president to spend money on illegal amnesty. Ooh. You're scaring us, Ted Cruz, with how dramatic your response is going to be to this president, uh, the, the president's unlawful behavior. Think about this for a minute. Ted Cruz is among the most muscular critics of Obama. And there's a contrast in what we just played between you have a despot. You're saying he's he's behaving illegally, unconstitutionally. And then what's your response? Your response is so ineffective, it's practically putting me to sleep just to hear what you're saying. 
a two-step process, which amounts to this. Block the president's nominees. Ooh. And stop funding the government beyond the vital essence of, of, uh, of the government. You know, use the power of the purse. You know what those two things amount to? Gridlock. That's all that is. But we already have gridlock. So how scary is that? The president still gets his way. He still gets to have it his way. And what's worse is, how can you say that you have a man who is now a despot and all you're doing is we're going to block the nominations at best? We're going to block the nominees. We're going to use our power of the purse. And even then, we never want to take it to the point of a government shutdown. Oh, no, we're too afraid of the mainstream media. We're too afraid of a backlash. We're too afraid. That's the problem with the Republicans. They are too afraid to do what must be done. They are making fools of themselves. Why? Because on the one hand, they're getting the analysis right. And they're saying we are now confronted with an emperor. They're using words like emperor. The House Speaker said Obama's behaving like an emperor. They're using words like dictator. They're using words like lawless. So they're getting the analysis right. And then what? To say that the solution is namby-pamby? Gridlock as usual, which means what? Which means he gets away with it? That's what it means. How do any of these things stop him? How do they teach the Democrats a lesson that we don't accept this? How does that save our Constitution? It doesn't. It achieves nothing. In fact, you know what it's going to do? He's just going to issue more executive orders because he's going to say Congress isn't doing its job. Hence, I got to do more of these executive orders. That's the argument he's using, and they're going to fall right into his hands. You know why? Because he's made one fundamental calculation, that the Republicans are weak. Just as we've been saying in foreign policy, Putin and the Iranian leader, and the leader of Syria, and our enemies like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, they've taken the measure of Obama in foreign policy, and they've said, you know what, he's not committed to the fight, he's weak, so let's do whatever we want to do. President Obama has made the same calculation here at home. He's made the calculation that the Republicans are cowards, and that the people are apathetic. And this response shows that in that calculation, he is 100% right. I've been saying since the summer that the Republicans have got to tell him that we will impeach him. The only appropriate response to a despot is to tell him that we're going to remove him from office. There's nothing else to say. There's nothing else to do. And it's all on him. You see, because if we get down to the nitty gritty of we're going to block the nominees and we're going to st- use the powers of the purse and blah, 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 blah. You lose the American people. This sounds like more of the same to them. It just sounds like a lot of noise. A lot of noise, frankly, about stuff they don't understand and they don't care about. So we're ceding the moral authority we have. We're ceding our high ground and we're falling into his trap. How do you stand up to a bully? You give him a black eye. First of all, you make sure that he never goes to the point of being a bully because you threaten him with the black eye before he even thinks of behaving like a bully. But our leaders are too weak to do that. So let me spell it out as clearly and cogently as I possibly can. You can't say that the man is behaving like a despot and then not impeach him. You're not making any sense. So what we have to do is say, Mr. President, your actions are illegal. And therefore, we are drawing up articles of impeachment right now. That's step number one. 
Don't bore me with step number one. You're going to block the stupid nominations that we don't even care about. Step number one is you draw up the articles of impeachment. And that list is long as to why this man deserves to be impeached. You present your case to the American people with a matter of urgency that the situation requires. What's step number two? Step number two is you build a massive coalition. Public opinion has to be on your side. This takes a long time, but you have to do it. And what key group do we need in order to impeach him? We need African-American support. We'd have to go out there to African-Americans and tell them, the president is destroying your constitution. And you know what else? He is destroying your economy and your livelihood. Because the one error that this president has made is this. He doesn't realize he's chosen the wrong issue. There's one thing propping him up, and it is African-American support. Once we level that, we can impeach him. And if we convince enough African-Americans that it is no longer in their interest, in their fundamental interest as Americans to support him, We move forward to step three, which is we impeach him in the House. And we know we can do that. So one, two, three, articles of impeachment, rally public opinion and African-Americans in particular to support the cause. And three, you impeach him in the House. And what does that do? It will continue to erode his standing for the next nine months to the next year All we're going to be talking about is how he is a despot and an emperor who deserves the appropriate response to his behavior. And if you think that his public standing is low now, it'll continue to to drop and drop and drop and drop because he's chosen the wrong issue. This is a fool's gambit. And if we have the strength and the will, we can crush him. And then there is step four, which is to actually try to impeach him in the Senate. And that takes a tremendous amount of votes. A tremendous amount of Democrats will have to break free. And you know what? If we whittle public opinion down and down and down over the course of the nine months, next nine months, who knows how many Democrats we can sway? Because he has also destroyed his own party. And we can convince Democrats that it is not in their long-term interest, not only as patriotic as Americans, but also as Democrats. He has destroyed them and he will continue to do so. Who knows how many of these Democrats we will peel off and perhaps we will even convict him in the Senate. That is the appropriate response. And you know what? At the very least, at the very least, you know what we're going to achieve with my strategy? At the very least, we are going to impeach him in the House. And that's not peanuts. That is the condemnation of the American people recorded in history for all time. It is the appropriate response. It's going to tie him up. He will be able to do nothing else. And it'll teach the Democrats a lesson. And we're going to whittle them down to the point that 2016 will be a cakewalk for Republicans. That is the least that we can do right now. At least impeach him in the House. And we can get there. That's doable. That's within reach. Now, you remember, I am so sick and tired of people playing God because only God is God. But you have so many analysts out there, just like in the midterm elections, when they were saying, you know what? We got to support Scott Brown in New Hampshire because the way we see it right now in our crystal ball, it will be New Hampshire that will be the one seat 
that'll make the difference between a majority or a minority in the Senate. So we got to support Scott Brown, even if it's contrary to our principles. And I was out there saying, don't play God. Just stick to your principles, do your job as the tiny human being that you are, and let God do his job. And that's my philosophy. When you do your job and you let God do his job, the results are astounding. Look what we did. We did our job. I did my job. I said stand on principle and don't vote for a candidate that does not uphold Republican principles. And we got the golden dream in the midterm election. We won the Senate and we even defeated an opportunist like Scott Brown, who doesn't deserve to be elected. So I don't want to hear people playing God as like, we're never going to be able to convict in the Senate. How do you know? You don't know. When you take a principle and you have right on your side, you don't know how many more people you will sway, how far it can go, and how victorious you will be. So I ask everybody out there, do your part. Take a stand for the Constitution and for this country. Do your part and have faith that God will stand with the righteous and do his. You're listening to Dr. Grace, who upholds values that are never going to die. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. American Heartland with Dr. Grace. And today we are so proud to feature a guest, Raheel Raza. She is the president and the founder of the Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow. Here to discuss the a battle, especially for women's rights in Muslim majority societies, our guest, Ms. Raza. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you, and I really admire and respect your work. Uh, We're basically going to feature today a documentary called Honor Diaries, and uh, one of the stars of this uh, documentary, an award-winning documentary regarding the struggle for women's rights, she is uh, Raquel Evita Saraswati, and she has actually received threats based on her role in the documentary. Can you explain what is going on? Well, you know, the biggest challenge to extremists and radicals is a strong woman. And they are cowards enough to put out threats because people like Raquel and I are fighting this battle against extremism and radicalization. And we speak out openly against this to say that the rise of extremism and radicalization within the Muslim world leads to oppression of women. And obviously they don't like the sound of that because that's what they're involved in. Uh, You know, this ISIS is uh, raping women, killing women, forcing them into slavery, forcing them into marriage. And these are evil, barbaric practices. And we make no qualms about saying this out openly and clearly. We have had rallies against ISIS We want the world to know that we uh, are not in favor of what they're doing. In fact, we're totally against it. So how do they respond? Like cowards, they put out threats. Uh, But, you know, for a young person like Raquel, it can be very frightening. Right, right. And uh, the threat that she received reads as follows. You need some righteous lashes from righteous men. Never step on our state die in the loose in the useless country that you are on this is the kind of threat that she received uh for her work and i gather that probably uh this is quite common does your organization receive many threats 
I do, personally, and they're pretty much on the same vein. You know, they think that they're very righteous, but they're on some sort of a depraved sexual trip. You know, this is about empower, uh, imposing their will on, on women, and they have these fantasies that they're going to uh, control women. And the ones that they can't control, uh, fortunately, we live here in the West where we have freedom and equality and safety, they start threatening with emails like this. So, yes, this is the common thread. And you'll note that there is specific mention of this country that you live, which is the whole angst about the West and the hatred for the West, which fuels the rise in radicalization. Their entire operation is based on hatred for the West and people in the West. Right. And uh, you're bringing today for our audience a fascinating perspective, a fascinating angle. Obviously, one reason that ISIS and and Al-Qaeda and these extremists want control is they don't only want control over territory. They want to continue to oppress women. Absolutely. You're right. That's what they've done for 1,400 years. And we have said no more. We are not going to allow this in the name of my faith. Raquel and I are both practicing observant Muslims, but we practice the spiritual aspect of our faith, which does not condone any kind of oppression of women. I mean, these guys are yahoos who have created an ideology that is based on hatred and violence and very much suppression of women. Right. You know, now, they can do you not ask me? Want uh, women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to ask yes, you a ahead. question for our audience that doesn't under, does not necessarily have uh, a detailed grasp of the Muslim faith and the struggles within it. Wouldn't yes. those who uphold the Muslim faith, these radicals, wouldn't they say that their vision of, of, of women is grounded in the Quran? What do you say to that? I'm sorry, I missed the question. So you're saying my, my the question is these 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 extremists like ISIS, right? Yeah. When they yes, oppress yes. women, they say that their view is grounded. It's based in the Quran itself. How do you respond to that? Yes. Well, we respond by saying that you obviously never read the Quran, and if you have read it, it is your own interpretation. Now, here's the problem within the Muslim world that we are struggling with, and the reform that we want to bring. The Quran is a book like any other scripture, where if you take Uh, a line out of context, it can be misused, and it can be misapplied. Now, the extremists, all the way from Osama bin Laden, all the way down to ISIS, they take just one one line out of context. But added to this, we have our uh, lack of leadership in the Muslim world. We don't have a leader who is going to stand up and say, no, this is wrong. So women like myself, who want to empower ourselves from within the faith, have read the Quran, and we say, you know, There are parts of it which are difficult to absorb, not applicable today, but we put that aside. But we need to interpret and understand it as believers in the idea that God has said men and women are equal. And so this, we can fight back even from within the Quran. You know, any book that you take one line out of context is problematic. And the Quran has been assembled not in chronological order, but from the longest verse to the shortest verse, So reading and understanding it can also be uh, a challenge. And for 1,400 years, it was always the men who interpreted it and translated it. It was only two years ago that the first Muslim woman translated the Quran. And trust me, it's a very different translation. Oh, fascinating. So what is, who is the name of this woman who translated the Quran? Her name is... Yes. Yeah, her name is Dr. Lale Bakhtiar, and the name of the Quran is called Sublime Quran. And if you Google the Sublime Quran, you will see this translation by a woman. And she's been slammed from one end of the world to the other for saying, oh, she has no right to uh, translate or interpret the Quran. Of course she does. It's the men who are saying that she shouldn't because she has given a softer, gentler interpretation. Even the verses in the chapter on women, which were always controversial, she has, uh, you know, expressed a different meaning of it. Right. Now, and uh, that is what we have to do. Right. I want to ask you this. It's, it's a provocative question. Let me be a little bit of a devil's advocate. I'm a historian Absolutely. and I used to teach um, uh, the Bible and I used to teach about the Muslim faith as well. And I want to ask you this question. We Christians, because the Bible is known as a historical document, we can say, well, look, that particular phrase references a particular historical period and the christian faith is one that evolves through time so the the bible is a historical document but the quran is different 
the Quran is understood by its believers as the actual word of God spoken through the prophet, the prophet Muhammad. So here's my devil's advocate question. <laughs> um, yes, go ahead. The, the prophet Muhammad, you are saying his words can be interpreted in more than one way. Even though it's not a historical document, the words that he spoke can be are still valid, but they can be interpreted in multiple ways. Is that your argument? No, that isn't my argument. What I'm saying is that we have to read the Qur'an as a historical document. And this is something that we have to take from Judaism and Christianity in Islam, because it is the youngest of the three monotheistic faiths, as you know. Yes. But the, the, the message of the Qur'an came over a period of 23 years at a different time and place in history for specific reasons. And if it is not read in the historical context, which unfortunately happens to be the case, people just read it without historical context, and it has a very different um, implication and application. That's correct, so but you see, one of the points to... of pride, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand here, yes. one of the points of pride of the Muslim faith is that that's precisely why they're different than Christians and Jews, because they believe that the Quran is the, the actual word of God rather than simply we... a historical document. I find it fascinating that what you're arguing is, oh, let's uh, let's mitigate that point by uh, following the path of the Christians and the Jews who see the Bible as a historical document and you'd like the Quran to be viewed in the same way by its practitioners, by its adherents. Yes, it, and, and it's not going to be an easy change, but that is part of the reform, that we would like it to be read as a historical document in the light of uh, certain specific incidents. And that's how I read it. You know, so if there's a line in the Quran that says that, you know, you can go and kill the enemy, it is because that was the only choice at that time. And if they did not kill the enemy, they would have been killed themselves. So it was actually permission from God for a moment in time to say, okay, this is the time when it's all right to go out and fight in self-defense. But here, listen, read these rules. These are the rules of warfare. Now, they never read the, the extremists, the radicals, ISIS. They never read the rules of warfare. But there is clear indication in the Quran, do not harm women and children, places of worship, people of worship. So it is a different understanding. And definitely this is what we are proposing. We are trying to uh, say uh, that it should be read in historical context. But that reform is not something that I can bring about because I'm just a grassroots activist. The reform has to come from the scholars and the academics. All we can do is light a fire under their feet and say, do this, because we have had enough. And especially since everything eventually boils down to suppression of women. Uh, you know, let women read the Quran themselves. Let them understand it, implement it, interpret it. I read it um, if there are parts of it that are maybe, you know, um, not quite up to the 21st century. I say, okay, I'm going to put this aside. And we'll come back to it later. But the large majority of it is about compassion and tolerance and spirituality and mercy and love. And that's what I want to imbibe towards my fellow human beings, uh, to people of every faith. And we need to talk more. We need to dialogue more about these issues. Right. Absolutely. And can you tell me specifically, when you're talking about the struggle for women's rights in Muslim-majority societies, what specifically are you guys fighting for? List all the rights, everything that you want changed. <laughs> well, first of all, we want them to stop killing women in the name of honor. We want them, these extremists in these countries, to stop forcing young girls to get married, underage marriage, forced marriage. We want, uh, you know, we want women to have the freedom to express their choices in uh, marriage and divorce, which is what essentially the message of the Quran was. You know, the, the Prophet got his first propo proposal of marriage from a woman who was older than him, who was a businesswoman, and he worked for her. So let's emulate that. Right. We want to go back, to, you know, only to the rights. The Muslim women were given rights to inheritance, to voting, to keep their married name, to give a proposal of marriage and ask for a divorce. None of this is now practiced. It's all been converted into Sharia law, which is man-made law, which is very anti-women. Right. It does not give them uh, human rights. We want Muslim women to be treated as equal human beings. So you reject which Sharia law. You, do, you reject Sharia totally, law. Totally. Definitely. Totally. totally. Okay. In, now, in, how far does this reform go? Today. Let me ask you this. How far does your vision of reform go? Do you also want to see women... Uh, be able to dress as they please, or would you uphold certain elements of the Muslim dress code? Well, 
Well, you know, there is really no Muslim dress code. It's basically modesty. And of course, I would want them to dress as they please. Modesty can be implemented in many ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not necess- There is no Muslim dress, essentially, because Islam was such a diverse religion in the early years. All the Quran says that, that both men and women should dress modestly. Right. I think that's fantastic. I agree. So that's I fantastic. That. Yes. <laughs> We're yes. on the same page. You know, Right. Well, yes. You know, you look at all the, uh, all the pop culture and the, you know, sexual in- innuendos. Do I want my teenage daughters to, uh, you know, be sexual objects? No. But do I want them to be covered from head to toe in a sack? No. What we want is a balance. We want Muslim women to decide for themselves, look, I want to put a scarf on my head. That's I want to wear a dress. I want to work. I, you know, absolute autonomy. That's the most important part. Individual freedom, which is what I came to the West for. My family and I migrated to Canada for the democracy, the gender equality, individual freedom, separation of church and state that this uh, country offers. And yet I have the religious freedom to practice my faith any way I want. Beautiful, brilliant. And let me ask you this. What kind of support are you getting from Muslim men that are in the West? Are you getting support for your project and your vision of what needs to be done? Or are you getting resistance there too? Both. Both. Uh, my biggest supporter is, of course, my husband, my son. I could never do what I do if it wasn't for the support of the men in my family. Therefore, we say that this battle has to be fought with the men. This is not uh, anti-men you know, movement or a feminist movement that says, you know, our men should be separate. We have to work with the men. We have support from some educated visionary men. We also get a lot of hostility. In fact, sometimes men will take uh, my husband aside, Muslim men, and tell him, you know, you give your wife too much freedom. So he just makes on, puts on an innocent face and says, well, you know, she also beats me. And then they shut up. So <laughs> <laughs> the point is that 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 we do need, uh, we need more men. I mean, this is a project that I'm not expecting to bring about change overnight, maybe for the next generation, but I do this work for the future of my children and my grandchildren oh, well, who happen I, to be Western Muslims. I, ex- I admire you tremendously from the bottom of my heart. We have been listening to a fascinating woman, obviously a trailblazer, Miss Raheel Raza. She is the president and the founder of the Council for Muslims Facing tomorrow. She is a visionary. She is a reformer. Uh, She also wants everyone to go to www.honordiaries.com. Honordiaries.com. Honor spelled H-O-N-O-R. Honordiaries.com. And uh, there you will find uh, a brilliant documentary about the struggle for women's rights in Muslim-majority societies. It has been our profound honor and privilege to have you as our guest today. Keep up the amazing work, Ms. Raza. Thank you, my fellow Canadian. Wonderful to talk to you. <laughs> we'll have you on again. We want regular <laughs> updates. You. Okay. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Thank you. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. It's that time of the week again when we tell somebody to just shut up. And this week it is Gwen Stefani. She is a brilliant performer and she is now a judge on The Voice. And as you know, I'm a fan of all these singing shows because I think they do represent the American dream. I think this good entertainment overall. And yet I've been dismayed. I was dismayed during the summer with America's Got Talent when you had Mel B and Heidi Klum, women in their 40s, flirting with young contestants. And guess what? Gwen Stefani, another woman in her 40s, a mom of several children, and she just can't help herself. She just can't sit there and be a judge 
and show us her brilliance, her expertise, her savvy. By the way, I've seen Gwen Stefani in concert. I'm a concert goer. I go to all kinds of concerts. And I had so much fun at her concert. So basically, this is from the perspective of an admirer. I don't think she's a great vocalist, but she's an incredible performer. So here I am enjoying the voice. And I really want to hear the advice that Gwen Stefani has to give to the young and up up and coming artists. But even this mom and 40 year old something, a woman who should stand in her own right, can't help herself. She has to flirt with an attractive young man right there in full view. There's a contestant on the show. His name is Ryan Sill. And he's a good looking guy by all accounts. And he's really mediocre in his talents, let's be honest. He's been saved a couple of times. Last week, he was saved by the audience, so he's still on the show. And every single time she is interacting with him, you can tell by her body language and the things that she says, she is stepping out of line. Listen to how impressionable and young and immature and eager, too, To become a singer, to become a star, is Ryan Sill. How easy it is to take advantage of a young man like this. Roll it, Brittany. My name is Ryan Sill, and I'm from Sterling, Virginia. Right now, I'm working full-time at Lowe's, and I'm a loader, so I'm lifting heavy objects all day long. The blind auditions were absolutely exhilarating, and it it was definitely nerve-wracking, but I think the pressure to be able to feel that pressure... Uh, really made me feel alive. I turned it into a positive kind of thing. My song had a lot of chair turning moments and Gwen turned her chair before I had even hit one of those. You can hear how young and impressionable he is. You can also hear how, guess what, Gwen Stefani? It's in his self-interest to flirt with you, to fool you. So from the mere perspective of self-interest even if he should reciprocate your interest in him maybe he's just using you to get ahead did it ever occur to you that you may be manipulated in all this that you're acting like a fool from every level but what I really want to hammer home is I want to pound the morality of the issue this is a mom with her own children and instead of acting as a true mentor She keeps saying things to him like, oh, I listened to your tape 15 times in my car. I don't know why I did, batting her eyes. You know, this is what she said last week. I don't know. I not only love your voice, I adore you. This is what she's saying on national television to an impressionable young kid. Shame on you, Gwen Stefani. Take some hormone pills or something because she said, said on the show that she's currently nursing her newborn and she's out of whack. And we can see it. You're out of whack, lady. So just shut up. Now, let's go to the mailbag. Oh, I can calm down. We've got Tammy from Sarasota, Florida. Thank you, Dr. Grace, for bringing the severity of the threat of Al-Qaeda and ISIS to our attention America needs to wake up. You got it. Our enemies are getting stronger. They're uniting against us. And yeah, we're supposed to believe President Obama's garbage that everything is going well in our air campaign against ISIS. It's not going well. It's getting worse for us by the day. And from Jason, Jason from Burlington, Vermont, I'm glad you highlighted President Obama's role in increasing America's terror threat. But what about President Bush's part in creating anti-American fervor globally? Well, you know what? I'm not so sure about this anti-American fervor that he created. Uh, I got to tell you this. When I was I was in Italy during President uh, Bush's term and one time I sat down with a young waitress and she said, Man, I respect that man, Bush. I may not agree with him, but I respect him. See, the thing about Bush is he may have created some anti-American sentiment, but he was feared. And it's better to be feared than to be liked, as Machiavelli said. I love your show, Dr. Gray, says Tony from Vail, Colorado. Thanks for calling it like it is. And thank you for properly identifying illegal aliens instead of kowtowing to political correctness and calling them undocumented workers. This show is not politically correct, and we are going to continue to call it as it is. Mike from Seattle, Washington. I'm a staunch conservative and am still celebrating the GOP's recent win in the midterm elections. 
But I'd like to know what you think is the key to changing the hearts and minds of diehard liberals. Wow, that's a great one, Mike, from Seattle. How do we change the minds of diehard liberals? To be honest with you, we really can't change their minds. The good news is that they are not a majority in this country. What we can do is we can reinforce and strengthen the hearts and minds of conservatives and Christians to take a strong stand against liberals. And that's how we will ultimately achieve dominance. But as for changing liberals, I've never succeeded in changing their minds. You know why? They are immune to rational discussion and logic. Hence, the best we can do is understand that they are a minority that needs to be put in their place. This is Dr. Grace. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to your letters at values that never die at hotmail.com. And you'll tune in, hopefully, again next week, same time, same place. This is Dr. Grace upholding values that will never die. Ordinary place with the stars and stripes. And the eagle fly. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace.